Hello, my name is Daniel, and this is the Engineering Success Podcast, episode 38. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I hope you guys are having a good week. I know I'm having a good week because I have a guest this week. Yes, in a minute, I will introduce our guest, but it is very, very exciting to have a guest on the podcast. This is our first guest in a long time, and the cool thing is that this guest is somebody that came from my interactions on social media and on Twitter. So our guest today is Mark Levine. Later, you'll hear me incorrectly say his name multiple times as Mark Levine, but he is Mark Levine, and he is of Mark Levine Jobs and of Thermo Systems USA. And uh, his experience is phenomenal, and his experience is working as a recruiter and in talent development, as you will hear on the podcast, but very exciting to have him on. But before we get into that, let's give our shout out. Shout out to John Ott. John Ott is our top tier supporter of the podcast. You can join John Ott in getting a shout out at the beginning of every single episode of every podcast for just $10 a month. You can support me on Spotify for podcasters, which is my link into the bio, or on Patreon. I really appreciate your support, John. Also, if you want to leave a five-star review, I will read it out on the podcast. Leave it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere I can find it in my mailbox. You can mail it to me. Whichever way you want to leave me a five-star review, I will read it out on the podcast. But without any further ado, let's get into the podcast. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Well, Daniel, great. How you doing? Good. So uh, for those of you that don't know what Mark does, Mark, I'm going to give you your intro as you are on screen. So Mark is the talent acquisition and learning and development leader for Thermo Systems, a full service control systems integration company that works in the industrial EPC, which is exciting to me, and the architect engineer industries. He has an extensive background in human resources and talent development in the engineering and professional services industry and has worked for companies of all sizes, ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies. In addition to that role, he also is the founder of the ABCs of Control Systems Engineering, which is a Twitter slash LinkedIn page that I interact with pretty regularly now, and a website blog dedicated to helping control system engineers grow in their careers. And you're also the founder of the Jobs and Careers Advice Forum on Facebook and in Twitter, where you also offer career and job search searching advice to others. So thank you, Mark, for coming onto the podcast and bringing your extensive experience and resume to the podcast. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. And let's get something out of the way here. I think congratulations are almost in order. Uh, here are a rumor that there's a newborn on the way. So uh, I look forward to you being up at night at two o'clock in the morning feeding a baby. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, I, I really want to bookend the the 4.45 a.m. wake up time with the 2 o'clock a.m. baby feeding. Uh, I, I, I just don't think I'm getting enough sleep. So I'm really looking forward to getting even less. You get it in now. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 seriously trying. I also noticed that you are wearing an FAU shirt for those that are watching the video version of the podcast. Uh, so FAU alum. No, unfortunately not. Uh, Syracuse didn't make the NCAAs this year. So yeah. I, I guess I had to just switch to something that was a little bit more successful. Well, you know what? That actually brings a wonderful tangent. What I'd like to do is kind of start the conversation off by starting with your career progression and what led you to this career path. So where did you go to school? And you said, I'm guessing Syracuse. And what did you study? Well, first of all, when you get into this business, nobody ever grew up wanting to be a recruiter. I, I can say that assuredly. You kind of drift and fall into it. Uh, I went to Syracuse, and uh, I was actually in the SI Newhouse School of Broadcasting. So that was my original goal. And uh, this was during the mid-1970s. And um, it was very tough back then, because if you didn't have a connection in the field, you were going to start out in some small market. And if you were lucky, you'd make it to a big town. Uh, it's kind of hard to make it to New York City or Los Angeles. And uh, I took a little course at college called The Sociology of Work. And uh, I found it extremely interesting. I had a great professor, Dr. Edelstein, who I called years later before he passed and thanked him for that experience because I learned a lot. Uh, we read uh, Working by Studs Terkel and a lot of interesting books on careers and how people gravitated to them. 
Uh, but what ended up happening is I uh, met my wife at Syracuse. Uh, she also went there, but she was a VPA, a visual performing arts major. And uh, we were friends. It was kind of like a Harry met Sally kind of a deal. Aww. And uh, she went out with my friends. I went out with her friends. And then one of our friends said, you guys are crazy. You need to be together. So uh, her mother had a big job at Bloomingdale's in New York City. And uh, she convinced the heck out of me to get a job there in buyer as a buyer trainee, something I absolutely did not want to do. I grew up in a retail family. My father was never around. He worked for Macy's Corporation. He was always working uh, weekends and late and, uh, you know, everything that everybody hates about retail. And uh, I took that job and it's a very prestigious training program there. And after two weeks, I realized I was right. I hate this. And I went into that department <laughs> and told them that I didn't want to work there. And they looked at me with a stare saying, nobody ever quits the Bloomingdale's training program. I said, well, I guess I'm going to be the guy who did. Now, she didn't get my wife a job there. Uh, obviously, <laughs> that wouldn't have worked out. She stuck me there because I guess she felt that I was a wayward soul and I wasn't going to land in anything that was worthwhile. So my wife had gotten a job with a small employment agency on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. So when I left Bloomingdale's, my wife recommended I go over there and talk to those people. What do they have for me? I went over and I chatted with the, their recruiting specialist there. And after a few minutes, she said, you know something, you're for this business. I think you'd be really good. Why don't you give it a try? So for $95 a week, draw versus commission, because that's what they paid back in those days, pretty much nothing. Uh, I was commuting from New Jersey to New York City. It cost me more to commute than I made. And uh, I found out I was doing very well with it. I, I started to pick up a lot of really large companies as clients, uh, particularly in the financial industry. And then I realized after about a year that, you know what? I don't have to come to New York City for this. There are agencies, uh, recruiting services in New Jersey. And I took a job with management recruiters, which was a great job because they taught me everything I needed to know how to recruit. And uh, I stayed in that for a while, and I was offered a position as a director of career services and placement at a large technical trade school. I stayed with them for about seven years, and one of the companies that I was placing my students in offered me a human resources role as employment supervisor. So that's kind of how I found my way into it. And then beyond that, I went back and forth between both the human resources field, it was called personnel back then, and staffing. So I've really had a real holistic view on this whole industry. I've worked on every side of it. I've been in recruitment advertising. I've been uh, in the consulting end of it. I've had my own agency as well as being a former general manager for a large light industrial staffing company and an HR director for a major media company, which kind of brought things together because it, it pulled me into what my original major was. I was actually doing all the recruiting and hiring for an organization that had newspapers and radio and television. So uh, I've had a really interesting career and it's taught me a lot that I, at this point, I really wanna share with, with people. And uh, being in the engineering field, I find that the people that I'm working with are the people who probably need it most. So that's kind of how I got here. So it's, it's, it's really cool that you, that you kind of, I guess, fell into it, but also got to exercise your passion along the way. And I guess I, I noticed that that might be why you might be so willing also to show up on podcasts, maybe a little bit of media in there, right? Yeah, but, over the years I've always dabbled in it. So I've, I've written uh, syndicated columns and uh, yeah. all sorts of things. And when I had my recruiting company, uh, we hit the big recession of 2008. And, and I was kind of forced to reinvent myself. And I opened up a social media marketing division of my company, yeah. but geared to helping big companies become employers of choice. You know, there are a lot of companies that have big signs in the stores saying that they're one of the top 100 companies to work for. You know, mm -hmm. I always felt bad for the little companies out there that were probably just as good or even better. And, and then you get a plug. So yeah. uh, that led me to this world where you and I met. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad that we met in this world. Uh, you know, it's funny that you say that. Um, well, I also share your passion towards for media, obviously, because I have the podcast. My passion comes from watching the, the movie Anchorman when I was in high school, and yes. I I loved it so much that I then committed to becoming the news anchor for my university's news station, my freshman and sophomore year of college, and uh, now I'm continuing to live it out here. 
But did you go to F if did you go to FAU? Because if you did, then I'll give you the shirt when we're done. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. No, I went to a lovely university called Trinity University in San Antonio. Texas. I know it's yeah, it's a good school. Yeah. But you know, I also somehow found my way into engineering and, and I know that you found your way into engineering. How how how'd you actually get into engineering? What was that what was that pivot that made you realize you needed to work in engineering or you just kind of fell into it? What happened there? There is not a field that I have not recruited for, including healthcare, uh, engineering, uh, property management, sales and marketing. Um, this came to me in a very strange way. I was at a company I wasn't very happy with. It was a large real estate development property management company. And uh, I really wanted out of there, but you know how tough it is. You know, you're making a decent living and you don't want to really separate unless you're sure you have something. And a friend of mine who is in recruiting called me up one day and asked me if I wanted to take a kind of a consulting assignment with an engineering company, Thermo Systems, a small company. They only needed to hire about 10 people and then pretty much it would come to an end. Quote, unquote, Jan said to me, Mark, there's no chance that this is ever going to be a permanent role for you. Um, <laughs> that changed pretty quickly. When I got there, I, I fell in love with the company. It was the best company I ever worked for in 40 some odd years of of uh, being in various uh, roles. And uh, miraculously, after about five months, uh, I don't know if the FCC is involved here, but the blank hit the fan. And all of a sudden we were hiring a tremendous number of people. And they said, Mark, you're not going anywhere. You're sticking around. You know, Now we have 60 openings. The next year it was another 60. Then it was 75. And all of a sudden the guy they didn't need forever ends up hiring another recruiter to work for him. And it's a funny yes. story. The one that's working with me now, I stole from my alma mater, Syracuse. She was the yeah. director of career yeah. services for the engineering school. And she asked me if I knew of any career services roles out there. And I said, I don't really work in that world. You know, I'm more on the recruiting side. So I said, ah, just to be nice, send me your resume. And I saw her resume had a good 15 years of recruiting experience before she took the role at Syracuse. So I said, oh, that's it, you're coming with me. So uh, we hired her and uh, surprisingly now, uh, we're 265 or 270. We I keep losing track of the numbers. We keep adding people, uh, person, company. And uh, we just hired two more recruiters actually to work the West wow. Coast uh, in Anderson, Nevada. Uh, our projections are going through the roof. Uh, we were supposed to be at about uh, 325 at the end of this year. All of a sudden, that number has been bumped up to about, say, 350, 375. And projections are we should be somewhere between 650 and 700 team members uh, within three years or so. So I guess I'm not going anywhere, and neither is she or the other two people we brought on board. Tremendous company, lots of opportunity, lots of great jobs, wonderful culture. Uh, I leave my house every day, and my wife asks me if I'm going to adult daycare because they buy us lunch every day. Uh, they're taking us for our 25th anniversary, the entire company and the families as well to an all expenses paid trip to Disney World in June. Oh my gosh. Uh, I've never heard of a company doing that. Uh, the flights are covered. Uh, we're staying at the Dolphin Resort. Uh, plane fares covered, food and beverages, ground transportation. The only thing we have to buy are Mickey Mouse ears and I don't think they look very good on me these days. So uh, it is, uh, it's a very special place. Yeah. So how long do I have to get my foot in the door before I can get on the trip? Well, you can probably just disappear off the screen and they'll never know where you went, but you can come come with us. Yeah, I'll, I'll let my employer know now. Consider this. No, actually, don't don't, do don't, don't consider don't, don't consider this my notice. I don't my want notice. Our boss to get a call from him on uh, Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so you, you described uh, you know how wonderful it is working for Thermo Systems. Can you also talk about what it is Thermo Systems does and and where what their place is in the industry? I'm not really an engineer, but I'll take a shot at it. Now, we, we are a systems integrator. Uh, for people that don't know what that is, it's we basically take PLCs and HMIs and uh, program them uh, to do whatever automation we need done. Now, we focus primarily in power and HVAC. Uh, this company had an earlier start, and our two owners both worked for them as engineers. Uh, the company wasn't doing well. They weren't Our, man, our owners were not happy there. Instead of looking for other jobs, they took over the company. So that company was involved in oil and gas and mining. We do nothing in oil and gas anymore. We do have one major mining company. Uh, yeah. I won't mention names because I don't know if I can. And uh, they then took the company and 
built it in their own image. Uh, we, we started working in life sciences, uh, some major companies like Merck Pharmaceutical that I know I can mention, uh, doing a lot of work in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, doing a lot of work in hospitals and, and laboratories. Uh, we do hospitals from coast to coast, uh, laboratories, including the National Institute of Health, Food and Drug Administration. And here's a little tidbit I think everybody will like. We were the company that worked on the cooling for the initial Moderna vaccine. Uh, wow. That was a joint project between Merck and Moderna. And because we were with Merck, we backed into doing that work. So that's kind of one of our claims to fame. There, there are a number of them. Uh, then from there, they started working in district energy. Uh, large organizations with lots of acreage and buildings want to have their own power destiny. And uh, they decide perhaps to go with a microgrid or a cogeneration facility on a campus. Uh, just gave it away. We do a lot of work with colleges and universities, including in your state, Louisiana. Uh, we do everything from Princeton University to Stanford on the West Coast and a lot in between. And we do not so much the microgrids and cogens, but we do the controls for them. So you'll find our engineers and technicians working in, say, a chiller facility where they're, they're, uh, they're creating perhaps HVAC or working in the physical plant where they're getting their power and uh, shifting it all over their campuses. Uh, a claim to fame in that area, we do business campuses and a business campus that many people might be familiar with is Hudson Yards in New York City. Uh, that's wow. an area of New York that was developed uh, over basically where they store uh, subway cars. They put a platform and built skyscrapers above it. We did the microgrid. So at that point, the company had about say 60 employees, maybe a $60 million company. But then things really took off. Uh, our executives ran into some people and was building, and still are, major data centers all over the world. Yeah. They Huge. gave us some work. They liked what we did. They gave us more. They liked what we did. Then they asked us to go overseas. So we became an international company. We opened up an office in Odense, Denmark, and then recently one in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we're planning on something in Berlin. And uh, following, who else came along but Meta, Facebook. So wow. we've been doing work for them. That's been growing as well. And then a number of other big data center builders. Uh, and there it's all about power and HVAC. You know, you think you have a large area where there's a tremendous number of servers or peripheral equipment running. It draws a lot of power. I believe they draw 2% of a local power grid to power those facilities. Uh, they're usually 10 or 12 buildings, and years to build them. And um, we then also are involved in trying to keep the equipment from overheating. So the HVAC part of that is to, you have all these computers running 24 by seven, producing a tremendous amount of heat. And uh, we need to make sure that they don't go offline. So that became the third uh, rung. And recently we announced, uh, at least, I guess it was December or January, that we're getting into semiconductors. We have our first client starting later this year. Uh, that is pretty much the same as HVAC. I mean, it's not cooling, but it is airflow. So you, know, you have to have a clean room environment for creating semiconductors. And uh, it's got to be dust free. So filtered airflow. And we do a little bit of manufacturing to uh, leftover from our old days. Clients like Nestle's, uh, Sam Adams beer. Uh, you wow. got to keep the chocolate from melting in the beer cold. So that's kind of what we do for them. Wow, that is that is a very good summary of what you guys do. That it's it's really cool. I mean, and obviously we know that data centers are becoming. I, I'm latching on that because there's a lot of them coming. I used to live in San Antonio, and I remember a bunch of them yeah. popping up in and around San Antonio, and and hearing about the the strain or the the mitigations that our local power utility was having to put in place to kind of plan for that. And obviously, you know, the utilities are doing that, but also the the data centers themselves, all the work that they do, and y'all's involvement with that. It's, it's pretty cool to see what how what y'all are doing is so involved with our day to day life. But wait do you see what's coming down the pike, because we're doing a lot of work now in the Midwest, and that area is now being referred to as the Silicon Prairie. So really? there are at least uh, six to eight major data centers that are going to be built in places like Omaha, Nebraska. We're already there, uh, and yeah. then throughout the rest of the Midwest. So uh, it is really a good opportunity for uh, junior engineers and experienced people as well, because uh, there are many different roles, at least with us. Uh, to get involved in that. Uh, it, it's going to be with us for years and years and years um, because there's so many people using social media and there's such a need for it. And there's something new now called co-location centers, which I call the storage sheds of data centers because 
there are a lot of smaller companies that really can't afford to have their own major data center. So these data centers being built and they're renting space, server space, mm -hmm. to mid-sized and smaller companies. So that's just going to just explode that industry. Because uh, there are only so many really super large companies that are the size of Google and Facebook. Now you're going to give an opportunity to some of these mid-sized companies to buy in and get an opportunity to have their data center equipment there. Interestingly enough, I vaguely know what you're talking about because one of my good friends, we tease him about how he doesn't have a real job because he works in the cloud. Uh, but he explained that concept to me. And it, it's it's so interesting how, I mean, obviously it makes sense, you know, Microsoft and Google would have their own uh, data centers, but, you know, even other larger companies don't necessarily have the, the infrastructure. If that's not their predominant thing they do, they still need to have their stuff housed somewhere. And uh, those co-location centers are, are where it happens. So really cool. Thank you so much for kind of giving an overview of what you do. It's It honestly sounds like Thermo Systems is, a, is the place to be. And I, I really wish you luck. And I, I know you mentioned that y'all are hiring. We are uh, hiring a number of people in different locations worldwide. Uh, the way it works with us, the way we're set up is that uh, you might come on board as a control systems engineer. That's kind of level one, uh, somebody out of school or maybe two years worth of experience in the field. Um, we have something at our company called Thermo University, which is a built-in university for us. It's got its own logo and course catalog, just like other schools do. Uh, it's been around for about 12 years, so it's been around since we were a small company. And uh, that's amazing because small companies don't have large training departments. As you know, I'm involved in that somewhat. And it's very robust. And one of the reasons we have it is because most of the colleges and universities, uh, at least up until recently, Mechatronics has come along. But up until recently, a lot of the major colleges don't do a very good job training their students in automation. Um, they may get a chapter on PLCs and HMIs, and that's kind of it. Uh, we yeah. have to take them the rest of the way and teach them about Alan Bradley and uh, yeah. Siemens and the whole line, Moticon, Amron, you know, G. Fanuc, uh, and all the languages that are associated with it, RS500, Studio Logics 5000, Factory Talk, Wonderware. You know, that's all stuff. That's not hard to learn. It's no code language, but still, uh, we can't send them out until they know how to program these things. And then on the flip side of that, they have to understand electro electronics and mechanics because uh, we're also installing this and connecting it to the existing equipment that needs to be automated. So they need to learn how to troubleshoot, debug, repair, test, pumps, motors, gauges, valves, sensors. Uh, so there's a lot to it. Uh, you know, and as you know, we probably know at the end of the whole process, you got to commission the stuff. You got to make sure that before you hand over the keys to the house, that everything that you've set up is working. Not only our equipment, but also their equipment. So we've got to make sure that their pump works because you can't automate a pump that doesn't work. And exactly. we have to do the work we need to do to make sure that happens. Yeah. yeah it's so funny. That's level one. Yeah. Level two is called a lead control systems engineer. And that's somebody with maybe three or four years of experience. They already can fly solo. They can go out on their own. They can do all the things that we need them to do. They know a little bit more about SCADA. And um, hopefully, because we're growing from within, they can also mentor the junior engineers. That's a big piece for us because a lot of people at our company get promoted. We'd rather develop our own people than bring people in from the outside. You know, They know our culture. They know how things get done. And then the final step in that part of the work is called the control systems project engineer. And that's somebody with say five to 10 years of experience. And they're really subject matter experts. They know everything there's to know and they're kind of the big troubleshooters because they've seen it before and they really know immediately what needs to get done. And, and they're very, very good at mentoring. So those are the levels if you want to stay in that rung. You know, things like project managers and things along those lines that people can qualify for. And then also specialty areas like uh, power and also uh, uh, commissioning, which I mentioned. Uh, we're actually hiring about five or six commissioning people right now. And wow. those are people that really know their stuff inside and out because they have to test everything. Wow. So it's, it's interesting that you say that. My gears were turning in the back of my head, by the way, because I did take a controls class, electronics 
mechanics, digital logic and design, and I had a lab um, that where I learned how to program uh, PLCs. So I don't know, maybe Trinity engineers are good for you. I always have to put in the Trinity plug. So maybe I'll get you in connection with our uh, our department chair. That'd be great. We, we'd appreciate that. And uh, I'm sure we do a good job for them. Yeah. Okay. So, so you kind of talked about the progress that people, engineers go through whenever you're hiring them. So, so what are the most important skills whenever you're hiring that entry level, fresh out of college engineer? What is the most important thing that you're looking for whenever you're doing that first interview? Got to be fit. Uh, you know, you, one of the issues I think today, particularly, and this is kind of my, my thought leadership uh, the area that people overlook the most are soft skills. Um, you could be the brightest engineer or the brightest technical person on earth, but if you can't be put in front of customers, uh, if you have a hard time being part of a team, uh, if you don't know your way around the business etiquette, uh, it's not a good reflection on a company like ours to, to have you working there. So we want to make sure that the people we hire are people people that they understand everything that has to do with not just people skills, but also organization skills, things that they just don't teach in college and they really need to. I've had this discussion with career services directors all over the country and asking them why they don't spend more time on these things. And you get the same story that you get with high schools when you talk about why don't you expose students to more careers? Well, there's not enough time. You know, We have other things that we need to teach, but if you're spending $70,000 a year to go to a top-notch school, you got to be the full package. And they, start, they have to start looking at these things and producing holistic uh, employees that companies don't have to spend billions of dollars uh, training them in their own image. I mean, part of Thermo University involves soft skills. Um, we have classes on everything from making presentations to writing skills and things that frankly people should have learned more in high school and if they didn't then they should have picked it up in college but everybody thinks that hey if they're really really good in their area of expertise technically then that's it that's all they just waltz in and get a job there's a lot of competition and there are a lot of people that maybe have 3.5 or 4.0 grade point averages and they're sitting on the sidelines when uh, the jobs are offered and still waiting because they, they lack those skills to present themselves properly. How do you evaluate those soft skills in the interview process? Is it, is it just as simple as how they, how they communicate with you over email and what they, how they carry a conversation on the phone? Are there, are there any metrics that you kind of look at to evaluate that? It's a combination of things. And that's really what interviewing is. It's a combination of things. You know, sometimes somebody won't get a job and they'll reach out and ask me, Mark, why didn't I get the job? And, I really can't say because it's a number of different factors that we're looking at, but I don't, my thought leadership here is I don't interview people. I have conversations with them just like we're having here. What, yeah. The way I describe Thermo is probably the way I describe it to every candidate I meet with. And uh, the point there is that you want people to feel comfortable. You want to mm -hmm. kind of disarm them a bit. And when they know it's an interview, if you flash interview, people clam up quite a bit. You know, they're, they're on trial, so to speak. Uh, that's not what Thermo is about. That's not what I'm about. I'm about, let's have a conversation and see where it goes. And, you know, an old boss of mine used to say, if I could survive an hour with this guy and not want to run out of the room, then he's probably somebody or she's somebody that I want to work with. You know, it comes down to, is this somebody you want to go out and have a beer with? Uh, you want to feel comfortable with that person because you're going to see them more than you see your family. You know, you're on the job 40, 50 hours a week. And you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the people around you. You want to make sure that these are people that um, that you can send out and, and you're not going to have to worry about how they how they work out. You don't want to hear from a client, oh, that that engineer that you sent was really abrasive or uh, very rough around the edges. Uh, you want people to and, and you develop this, I guess anyone does over the years. But unfortunately, we don't have that long and people don't have that long. You know, you really have to hit the ground running. So if you're going to speak to a client who might be irate, you got to know how to um, how to disarm them a bit. Uh, okay, I understand. You know, thinking to themselves, yeah, I guess I have to take a little bit of the guff because I represent the company, and uh, and just calm them down. You, you certainly don't want to get into a shouting match with them. Okay. And these are things that you learn in soft skills. These are things that you learn through being in the workforce for a long time. 
we try to speed up the curve by having the various classes in these things so that uh, somebody can perform at their best and uh, and really be appreciated as offering good customer service. And that's what Thermo is about. Our number one thing at Thermo is customer service. Our reviews are through the roof. I mean, we bend over backwards for our clients and our clients just stay with us. They keep coming back and they refer others. So it's the old sales adage that you get 20% of, 80% of your business from 20% of your clients. I don't know that that percentage is exactly right, but it's a big number because uh, one tells another and they say, hey, look, these guys are going to do a good job. They have good people working for them. Uh, they do what they say they're going to do. They get it done on time and they stand behind the work they do. So these are the things you have to teach the, the new people coming on board so that uh, you don't damage yourself as, uh, as a business. You, you want that consistency. So it's very important for your listeners, for the students and some of the junior people that are out there to get skilled in soft skills. They, they can do it on their own. There are plenty of great uh, learning sessions on uh, things like LinkedIn Learning, uh, eAcademy, uh, you know, Open Sesame. Uh, a lot of these courses are free. There's a lot of great books out there for those who like to read. Certainly a lot of great uh, videos on YouTube and elsewhere. Uh, so they don't have to wait to start for a company like us to develop them. They should be doing that alongside their education in college. Do you have a Do you have one book or two books that are your most recommended? I got all these <laughs> and more. I I don't know that I have one that I would say. I mean, I always tell everybody to start off with um, uh, Dale Carnegie's book, which is probably God knows how old now, from the 19, late 1940s, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, I think he does a great job in setting the stage for everything else you're going to learn. And then you got to departmentalize it. You got to just go online and look for a list of soft skills. And then take each soft skill one at a time and go into Amazon.com, put it in and see who the best sellers are. It's constantly changing. There's always somebody coming up with something new and better. I constantly read these things. You know, sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I don't. Uh, a lot of the times I learn a lot that I didn't know. And uh -huh. uh, you, you kind of almost have to make a hobby of it. And it's yeah. money. It's time well spent because the better you get at your people skills and your organizational skills, uh, I think the better you'll do as uh, as somebody moving up in a company. I feel like it's it's not necessarily just the book. Obviously, there's a bunch of really good insights you get from the book, but it's that that habitual process of wanting to better yourself in those areas, seeking that out, and then reading the book and reflecting on people. I mean, that's why I have the podcast in the first place, and that's why I do the advice column, not necessarily because I want everybody to agree 100% with my advice, but I want them to process the advice that I'm giving and kind of exercise that muscle themselves. So I feel like, you know, that that whole action of of kind of taking ownership and, and trying to thoughtfully grow is, is, is really the biggest part about it. Do you, what do you think? Well, you have to drive it yourself. That's yeah. really what the issue is. I mean, if you have a choice between, you know, watching a rerun on television or, you know, listening to the same album that you listened to 20 times and reading something that could be helpful to you. Uh, I think that's again, time and money well spent. You know, today you can buy a book on eBay for a dollar. That's a bestseller that would cost you $50 new. And it was only new four or five months ago. But, uh, you know, even when you're reading those books for a dollar, people write books because their thought leadership usually comes down to one or two things and they write a book around it. And I find when I read a book, I find what that one or two things is. And then I incorporate it into what I know, you know, and the rest of it is a lot of fluff and rehash, but, uh, that's not bad either because it confirms maybe what you've already learned or what you've read elsewhere, or sometimes it challenges some of those things. You say, no, oh, there's a different point of view here that I can look at. And maybe that other guy wasn't right. And this is right. So you gotta be, um, you gotta be a critical reader. You gotta be able to understand what you're reading and see whether or not it makes sense. Uh, and if it doesn't, that's okay. That just shows you're getting smarter because you can challenge it. Yeah. That's, that's a great advice. So, so we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about the soft skills and, and what the culture is at Thermo Systems. Do you have any kind of final words about how you kind of ensure that you find a good cultural fit with the candidate at your company? Or is it just really, can I have a beer with this person? Well, that's just kind of my perspective and trying to be light tonight. 
And uh, I, our process for hiring is not overdone, but it is complex enough. I mean, there are some companies that make people come back for 10 interviews. I think that's ludicrous. Uh, plus the fact that by the time you get to the third or fourth interview, they've probably taken a job elsewhere. Yep. So you have to speed things along a bit. But when you have a process, it's almost like putting spaghetti into a strainer. And little by little, all that water comes out of the little tiny holes and you're left with spaghetti. So I, I usually will do the pre-screen and we'll have a conversation like you and I are having or kind of discussing kind of the things that I discussed before. Yeah, you know, I'll start off with a question like, what do you know about our company? And I love that one because it's so easy that it's silly. And yet so many people, they don't know what to say because they didn't really visit your website. And they start to throw all sorts of things together that make absolutely no sense. And I don't want to have them struggle. So I'll say, okay, I'll fill you in. I'll tell you what there is to know. But I am making a mental point that they didn't take the time to look at our company. They didn't get to learn about it. How are you going to go to work for a company you don't know anything about? So exactly. we start there. And uh, then I'll tell them a lot about our history. And then we'll move into tell me about yourself. You know, we all know that question. And I'll hear how they organize their thoughts and some people even have problems with that. They struggle. Where do you want me to start? You should know that. You know, do you want to start from the beginning? Does it make any sense? Well, I went to PS 405 grade school. I don't think so. I think you want to start off with things that relate to what it is that you're looking to do. Put the rest on the side, because if you discuss all that, you know, you don't have more than half an hour to an hour for that interview. You want to get to the meat of things. You know, we want to know what skills they actually have. You know, how in-depth are their programming skills? You know, did they learn anything? Have they done anything? Did they have an intern or a co-op? By the way, everybody listening tonight, if you're in school, make sure that you get at least one summer co-op or internship. Uh, it is critical. The people that we take for these jobs or these roles, I'd say we hire about, we convert about 90% of them to full-time jobs. So it's a good opportunity to learn about a company over a summer. Uh, start doing the work to see if you actually like what you're doing and, and show yourself. I mean, are you going to be a good teammate? Uh, we get a lot of feedback from the people they work with. Yeah, I like this individual. Uh, great to work with. Very helpful. Uh, sometimes the feedback is not good. And, uh, and then we get into a little bit about our culture. I mentioned fit is very important. You know, I don't think I've ever had anybody that said to me, Mark, that's not the right fit for me because we offer so much. I mean, I can go into tons of things that we do for our team members. I mean, we buy lunch for everybody every day. That's an expense uh, for a company, but we want people to hang around and be with each other and get to learn each other well because then you collaborate better. So it, it makes sense. And uh, I asked our, our, our owner, I said, well, what happens, Dave, when we have 700 team members? Well, we'll continue to buy lunch for them all because it's something that I believe he believes in. So, you know, we talk about that. And I, throughout the whole time I've been at the company, there was only one candidate that ever said, that's not the right culture for me. Uh, and his reasoning, I, I respect it. He's not a people person. He doesn't really want to network with people uh, after work or, or spend a lot of time with them during the day, just put his head down and do the work. So we want to make sure that these people will work out. Then they go on for the second interview. And again, you have the people that they're going to be working with and their manager. Let's see what they think. So there's an opportunity for a second opinion. And then we have an on-site because you obviously want to show people where they're going to work. Let them actually physically meet the manager and the team. And again, you're getting another perspective. So little by little, you're getting all these tidbits and uh, there's some documentation that we fill out. And then we kind of cross-reference and see what everybody thought. And uh, then you go through, uh, after the offer stage, uh, the reference checking. What are other people going to say about this individual? Have they worked before? Uh, you know, have they given you a professor maybe that they took a class with? What is their perspective? And I'll always ask the question, look, we have a robust learning and development program. Are there any areas that you could recommend that we drill down on and focus when this gentleman or young lady starts with us so we can help them hit the ground running. And I, I got to tell you, most of them will tell you, they'll say, well, he or she has this little problem. And then you kind of wonder, okay, is this going to be problematic or is this something that they could just learn and move forward with? So it's a process. And I think everybody needs to understand that because nobody really teaches you what happens after you leave the interview. 
uh, you kind of wonder, gee, how did it go? I don't know. Um, the guy had a poker face. He really didn't share a lot about what he thought. But these are all the mental processes that go on as we decide whether or not we got the right person. And it's not science. I mean, there are times we get it wrong, but increasingly small. Uh, we, we've done enough validating and asking the right questions and spending time with that person to be reasonably assured that we got the person that we want. I like your process, by the way. I feel like three interviews is a good number. I, I, I've enough. seen, I, I don't know if you saw my, uh, the, uh, the one that I did on my, uh, a few episodes ago where it was like pre-screen, post-screen, manager, teammate, VP, director, VP, virtual onsite, panel interview. I mean, it was like, it was like eight different steps. And I, I know that it's gotten longer for some companies, but I feel like three is, I mean, if you can't make the decision after the pre-screen hiring manager and an onsite where maybe you meet the director or the, maybe the person that's the stakeholder above the manager. I feel like if you can't figure it out between those three, then then what are you doing? And you're, you're so right. I feel like it, companies that take too much longer than that, they're, they're really putting themselves at a risk where they're not going to be able to pull the trigger in time for the candidate to have not signed elsewhere. Well, so I, I really like the process. Have, they don't have confidence in their process. And that's the thing. You know, once you gain confidence that this is the way it goes and you have data behind you saying that, you know, based on the way we're doing things, most people that we're hiring, we're retaining because that's a major metric in recruiting and HR, human resources, retention. Uh, it's easy to hire people off the street, but if they don't stay more than, you know, six months or so, you got a problem somewhere in the way that you're doing things. And it's very, very costly to have to keep on replacing people. You know, people don't realize the cost of running ads and sponsoring them on Indeed and all the things that you need to do, the onboarding period, the, the amount of time it takes somebody to get up to speed and the mistakes they make during that period. You want to be right, but you don't, like you say, you don't want to overdo it and drag it out because you either lose people in the process or you kind of overwork the canvas and you become very nitpicky, which you can't be. You, you got to look at everything that you saw and say, well, this I can live with, maybe this I can't. You know, they don't have any of this, so this is just not gonna work. But this is something that if we work closely with them, we can get them up to speed relatively quickly. That That's kind of the thought behind it all. Yeah, I like it. So so kind of closing out the interview kind of discussion. So what is, what is the most common interview or application mistake? You alluded to a couple of them earlier, but what is the most common or most impactful interview mistake that people make in the process of applying for a new job? Spell check, grammar. Oh my God. You know, this is something I've seen over the years. It has not improved. I see some of the most God awful resumes that anybody can ever imagine. You know, a resume is only a marketing tool. It's just designed to get the company's attention. Mm -hmm. You don't want to run it too long because nobody's going to read it. You don't want to use very, very tiny print because then people can't read it. You don't want to talk about things in the resume that have absolutely nothing to do with what it is that you're applying for. Uh, I see some resumes that have an objective on the top, which, by the way, people shouldn't still be using, that say, I'm looking for a job in retail sales. And then they send it to us trying to, in the body of it, go into why they should be engineers. And it's like, well, you just kind of made your case that that's a retail not sales really position. You know, spend a little time and customize it. This is important. You know, you want to get a good job. You're looking for, you know, 60, 70, 80, $90,000. At least take the time and effort to put into that resume so that you check all of the spell. I mean, we have spell check on our computer. It's not a big deal. Uh, grammar, you could do that too, an editor on Word, and get another set of eyeballs on it. Have somebody look at it and uh, give you some pointers. And make sure, as I always used to say, a resume is very much like a trial where the attorney stand up and say, I plan to present that this individual is guilty of murder. And then what's the rest of the case? All the support for that. They don't talk about anything other than that. Well, that's what a resume should do too. I want a job as a computer engineer. Well, if that's the case, give me supporting evidence of why you should be considered for that and do it in a way where 
my attention is not distracted because there's so many spell check errors or grammatical errors or syntax errors using the wrong word. You know, I've seen resumes where people take a thesaurus. They take the resume they wrote, they try to use big words every other one just to show us how smart they are. And, and it, believe me, it doesn't come off very well. And remember, too, a resume only gets five to seven seconds of attention. Put all the important stuff up near the top because by the time you get to the bottom, you may not be a candidate anymore. So load it up, load it up front, uh, get my attention and get our focus going. And then, well, gee, he knows this. Well, let's see what else he or she knows. Let me go down further. If in the first part of it, you don't have what the company is looking for, there's no time to read every day. I mean, sometimes you're getting a hundred of these things in at one time. You're yeah. skimming, you know, five to seven seconds is not a very long time. So front load it. That's, that's very important. But please make sure that before you send anything out, it's proofed properly. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. You know, you've opened the door with the resumes. So I, one thing I, I really liked that you brought up is, is the customizing the resume for the job application. That's one of the things that I, I kind of hit on with people is you, you want to have your, maybe you have a longer form resume that has all of your experience and that's your, your basic one that you go off of. But for every application, you're customizing, you're tailing it, you're cutting it down to that job application. So you have basically, you're, you're kind of constantly updating your resume throughout the application process. You're not just slapping the same thing together and sending it everywhere. That'll improve your success. Now I have a, I have a couple of, I've, I've expressed a couple of different opinions and I've heard a couple of different opinions about resumes. So quickly, I'd like to go through a couple of them with you and kind of get your take okay. as somebody. So first of all, is there any level of experience at which it makes sense to have more than a one page resume? Well, I think some of that has to do with years of experience. Now, this is another problem. Everybody is at a race to see how many jobs they can have in a short period of time. This is a big bugaboo. I mean, people think that the more jobs they have, the more experience they have to offer. But to most employers, they see that as job hopping. So don't go back more than, you know, if you have anybody with a little bit more experience than entry level, don't go back more than 10 years. Uh, first of all, things that were done 10 years ago aren't done the same anymore. And also, it just lengthens the resume, and it, it may add s stuff to it that people during the interview, if you get one, are going to really want to drill down on and say, well, why did you change? You've had five jobs in the past three years. Why do you keep changing jobs? Uh, yeah. Then you got to defend yourself. You're not, you're not selling yourself anymore. You're defending yourself. Say, well, you know, and, and there's reasonable explanations. Company closed down. Company merged. You know, they had a general yeah. layoff. We, we get that, or maybe they've done some consulting. I mean, I've got resumes with 30 or 40 jobs on them, and people forget in parentheses next to them not to put the word consulting. They should, because uh, then we think, gee, were these regular full-time jobs? He lost them all or she lost them all? Oh, no, consulting. That's a different story. Yeah. You knew from day one that that job had an expiration date, and that's fine. But uh, I think that it's very important to keep it as short as possible. Uh, if you have a lot of years of experience and it's good experience, uh, and then you keep it under 10 years, yeah, you're going to have a few more jobs. You may go to a page and a half, maybe two pages, but I've had 15 page resumes and they're written like uh, doctoral theses sometimes. I mean, there's all sorts of jargon all over it, you know, assuming that people really know what all this stuff is, because even though we're in engineering, there's a lot of engineering things we don't do. And, you know, you got to sit there and try to figure out what does that mean? Is that something we do? So try to keep it simple. You know, maybe write it to an eighth grade education. Uh, try to keep it. Really, every fact or point on there should be an additional reason for that employer to want to see you. That's a good rule of thumb, by the way. You know, if you took a basket weaving course in college, keep it off there. Nobody wants to see that. You know, yeah. you want to just basically show that the, what we're looking for is that trying to find a candidate that needs the least amount of additional training. You know, that's that's a win for us. Because if we have to train people from scratch, it takes time and cost. So if you have stuff that you did on an intern or a co-op, please include that. Be specific. Some people will just put the company they worked at in the dates and nothing under it. What did you do there? That tells me nothing. So think about it. I always say, make believe you have $30,000 of your own money and you're starting your own little business. And you're going to hire somebody. All of a sudden, there's a sense of importance to who you hire. You're going to leave them there. They're going to be in charge of maybe your cash register or whatever. So you're going to really ha scrutinize those individuals and make sure that you're confident that this is somebody you really want dealing with your customers, 
you know, working with cash, et cetera. So my point is take pride in that resume, understand what the importance of it is to an employer and tailor that resume to show your best. So speaking of showing your best, skills section or no skills section? Yes, I agree. Skills sections are important. That's do you rate thought. the level of proficiencies of the skills or do you just give them as skills? Oh, they're going to be technically assessed. Absolutely. That's not my role because I'm not an engineer, but when they yeah. get into the next round, they're going to be asked some questions and perhaps even given some paper pencil testing or wow. as we call it because sometimes it's done on a computer. Um, well, we want to do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to know what they know. And we all also want to know what is their thought process in, in troubleshooting and solving problems. So we'll have them actually sit with somebody who's a, a qualified engineer and we'll say, this is the issue. How would you handle it? And then they'll walk you through the steps. And they'll say, well, gee, that's an awful long approach. And somebody who really knows the stuff pretty well, they'll, they'll know how to get from point A to point B better. And through our experience, we know what the answers generally are. So now we can do a little of our own data analysis and say, you know, we had six people in here last week. Freedom really answered those questions correctly. And they're all within you know, the same year of college graduation. So maybe this particular candidate isn't as strong as one of those others. So the more we interview, the more we approximate what we're looking for, uh, who does best versus the rest of the group. Do you, play, do you place any stock in if somebody ranks their own proficiencies on their resume or is it really not really that valuable? Well, that's something that shows us confidence. Are they confident about their skills? You get a lot of people you could tell that don't have a lot of confidence in their abilities. They're very apologetic or, you know, they'll fudge things. Um, you know, somebody who tells you that I have a lot more to learn about that is sometimes a better candidate than the person that comes in and says, oh, I know all of this. And then we end up technically assessing them and we find out that they don't. Uh, that's not being honest and truthful. You got to be honest and truthful about yourself. If you don't know something, say it. Uh, you're not necessarily out of the game. There may be other things that we weight a little bit more heavily and say, like I said earlier, well, maybe you don't know this that well, but you know that. And, you know, there's no ideal candidate. So employers have to uh, settle sometimes a little bit in certain areas. Say, well, okay, you don't have SCADA, but you're very good at programming and you're good at field service work. Uh, we'll train you the SCADA. Uh, but if you say you have a lot of it and you're technically assessed and you don't, that, that's a whole different ballgame. Makes sense. So speaking of skills, how about GPA? When does it make sense to leave a GPA off of a resume? I guess when it's low. <laughs> uh, I don't know what? that. Companies our size really don't put too much stock in that. Um, I think that there are the real big companies out there that do. I think for them, it's a matter of pride that they think they got the best and brightest, but <laughs> that's book knowledge. It's a whole different world out there when you get to work. Book knowledge doesn't count for that much. Uh, how do you perform? You know, do you think on your feet? You know, are you somebody that when I'll do a reference check on somebody, oh, Mark, this individual is wonderful. When he or she doesn't know something, they go home and they, they watch YouTubes and they really learn about the thing. They come back the next morning and they're ready to tackle the world. You know, so we're looking for the approach to things. How how do people manage and act in a consequential type of a role? Uh, and you can tell a lot of that, you know, whether or not they're that dedicated to, like you said earlier, drive themselves to read a book instead of, you know, something else that may not be as important to their careers. So there's a lot that comes out of these conversations and these interviews that not necessarily down on paper. But you infer things and then you, as a, a good interviewer, you probe further and say, well, tell me about a time where something that you did failed. What happened? Because you want to see how they handle that. Yeah. You might say, well, I banged my head up against the wall and I screamed and I threw things. We don't want that. But they might say, well, you know what? Failing is a good thing because you learn from it. So when I failed, I immediately went to find out how I could do it better next time. So these are the these are kind of the soft skills. These are yeah. the things that learning soft skills brings you to because you know how to handle certain situations. You know, you don't want to be caught with that moment. You want to always be prepared. And you don't want to come off as somebody who's 
overconfident either. You got to balance it, but you don't want to come off somebody that has good common sense and uh, is truthful and honest. And this is me. You know, I, these are the things I'm good at. These are the things I may not be as good at, but I do have a real passion for this industry because mm -hmm. either my dad was an engineer and I want to be like him or, you know, I've always liked sci-fi movies because when I watched one, I always looked at the apparatus on the deck of the starship or whatever the case may be. You know, make a convincing point that this is not just a job for you, but it's a passion. It's a calling, you know, kind of like you asked me earlier about uh, broadcasting and getting into to what I do. For me now, this is a passion. I, I just even at this stage in my career, I just want to keep getting better and better because I know when I do that, I'm going to hire some really great people. And then I get to, since I'm in learning and development, I get to watch them grow. And that's very rewarding to see somebody that you hired or helped hire two or three years ago. They've already made manager in six months or a year because they had something special. And the passion shows, especially from showing up on a podcast like this or, or, or obviously from the way you describe the work you do, the, the passion does show last, last one about a resume. If you're if you're seeing an an application come in from an engineering perspective engineering intern, do you expect to see anything from high school on their resume? If it's relevant, you know, if they were maybe in the Boy Scouts or some explorer programs, if they were in something like that, or the first program for robotics, yeah. there are a lot of kids that love that. You know, what that tells us is that you didn't make this up in junior year of college when you had to declare a major, you know, you actually wanted to do this and you went to college for that. And, you know, I'll ask them, do you think that your college experience was worthwhile? Did you learn what you thought? Is it the field that you think you still want to be in today after having gone through it? You listen for that passion and they say, you know, I was in that first program as a seventh grader and eighth grader. And, you know, I was a kind of a uh, kid growing up that uh, I had all the scientific toys. Uh, these are the things that really tell you about somebody's true interest. Because in any job, there are going to be good and bad days. You got to survive the bad days. You got to be able to say, well, I know tomorrow is going to be better and I'm going to work on this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, I love this so much that I'm willing to sacrifice a day or two where things didn't go well because I know tomorrow is going to be a better day. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the, the one of the, the most difficult p points of feedback that I got whenever I was, um, you know, first coming out of high school, early college student is like, oh, kill all that stuff from your resume. But obviously, if it makes sense, if you yeah, if you did like the the, the, the car race, the matchup car races or your you're part of your high school's amateur rocketry program, obviously, that's the kind of stuff that's interest, maybe not as interested in that you ran cross country. I mean, that does tell us something about you, but definitely the, the stuff that ties to the passion. I, I, I do appreciate that you still want to see that on a resume, which is, and, which is and good. And don't go off a board with it. It doesn't need yeah. a paragraph. You know, just a listing would be enough. Yeah, exactly. It, it shouldn't be the focus of your resume at that point, for sure. And it should so, be down near the bottom. Remember that yeah. first five to seven seconds of attention. Don't load that stuff up near the top because... Now you're saying, I don't have much to offer, so this is what I've got, and i got to put it up top. It's yeah. like, okay, this is another nice thing. That, that's kind of the way we see it. It's another nice thing. You know, it shows that there was interest early on and, you know, that you had that sort of a mind. Uh, you know, maybe you're not the person that writes poetry, but you're the person that invents things. Uh, that's kind of the message it sends. And just that making a note of it that, you know, in, in 1999, you were in the first program. Uh, that's probably all because we know what that is and we know what it means. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Makes sense. So, so we kind of talked through the process of interviewing. We talked about the importance of the resume. We've talked about soft skills, the importance of soft skills. Are there any other really important focus points or general advice that you have somebody for somebody that's early on in their engineering career or thinking about their engineering career? It's kind of a soapbox question. Yeah, I, I think that the only point that we didn't mention, I think when you're researching a career, the actual searching for the career, the decision-making process, talk to people that are in that career already 
ask them what the pros and cons are. You know, if you come to work for a systems integrator, you know, one of the things that you're going to have to commit to is that there's going to be about 40 to 60 percent travel. You know, the equipment is at the client location always. There are some things that you could do remotely, programming or maybe some design work or whatever. But, you know, we have a lot of offices, 21 offices, but we can't be everywhere. And we yeah. don't know what clients we don't have yet that we're going to have. And there's some states that they just don't have a proliferation of the kinds of companies that we would be working with. And we'll probably never have an office in those states, but we may have work in those states. Mm -hmm. So you may very well have travel where, all right, you leave the house, you go to the office, you go to a client, you come home. You may have one where you go to the client and it's a little far and you got to be back early the next morning. So you stay overnight or you're going to be away from maybe one to three weeks on a project that is ramping up. Maybe we don't need a full scale of, of numbers of people at that project, but at certain phases we might. So we may send the team out there to help along and, and you might be there and it's all company expense, no matter what company you work for. The only thing is that, you know, you're going to be a little away from home a little bit. You know, one of the things that, that are happening now in the changing landscape of employment due to the pandemic is that everybody wants to work remotely. Uh, it just, there's certain fields that that works. I get project managers that say, I want to work remotely. Well, the idea of a project manager is to have somebody on site, if something goes wrong. You know, you can't fly from Louisiana to Wisconsin and be there in 15 minutes and try to put out a fire. So you got to know what field you're getting into talking to people about, hey, what's good about it? What may not be as good? And then you got to take that information and balance it and say, well, yeah, I can I can deal with the travel. I like to, a lot of people say I like to travel. I like to see places. Others will say, no, nah, I don't like to be away from home. Well, then it's not the job or the company for you. So understand all of that. And the only way you can do that is really by talking to someone. Where do you find them? LinkedIn. Don't be afraid to email somebody on LinkedIn and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm considering a field in engineering. I see you're an engineer. You have a lot of great experience. Any chance we can possibly chat for 15 minutes? Most people that you reach out to will say yes. I've done it myself. It's Agreed. called an information an information interview it has a name and uh you're not putting them on a the spot you're not begging them for a job that wouldn't be the right thing to do if they like you they might offer you one or they might give you a reference but you're just looking for information about the field and the job and you know what are some of the have good questions prepared what are some of the challenges you face what's the most difficult thing you ever had to deal with and what did you how did you deal with it you know get an understanding of what that job entails it's it's not fluff it's 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 every day 40, 50 hours a week, whatever numbers of hours you're working. Built into that, you're going to run into all sorts of things. So you need to know what kinds of things you're going to run into most often. Sometimes it's rare. You know, you can just kind of discount it. You know, there was this time when, and then it never happened again. But really understand what you're getting into. I, I think that's the only part that we didn't discuss, and I'm kind of glad we did. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I, I can think of multiple occasions in my in my college experience where I, I, I reached out to somebody and I, I reached out to I met an engineer at at, at Nike and I, I said, hey, I want to learn more about what you do. And he, this is back when Nike was still making golf clubs. And I, had another, I met another engineer at Ben Hogan uh, when Ben Hogan was restarting back up as a as a golf company. And uh whenever they were, they were coming back in the 2016s and I reached out to them and said, Hey, I want to learn more about what you do. And then I actually, that was my first job uh, working for them. It, it, it turned into a job and I actually just got a LinkedIn message from the guy that hired me uh, last that's week. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it, so it, it doesn't it always turn into a job, but that's a personal story. And, and, and had they not gone through their financial restructuring, I, I might've tried to work with them. I know they're, they're still around though. Um, but uh, yeah, but it, it was a really cool experience, and you know, people you like golf. People... So we say we learned something about you tonight. You yes. Like oh, golf. yeah. You know, a lot uh, of these people that you reach out to, uh, ironically, yeah. they become colleagues, and uh, yeah. that's another thing a lot of students forget to do, and they need to network and build a good following on places like LinkedIn. I think I don't know what I have twenty seven thousand uh, people on my LinkedIn. Uh, I, more than I me. choose them. I I pick them for engineering because. It's a good recruiting tool for me. They know people. And uh, certainly if I can't use that person now, maybe in two years from now, I'll have a job opening and I'll reach out to them. Or maybe they go to work and one day and they were happy and they had a bad day and say, say to themselves, I'm getting out of here. You know, that 
Levine guy at Thermo. I'm going to send him my resume. All day long on my LinkedIn screen from the group, people are popping up, asking me what jobs are open, how do they apply. And, and that's a, a, a perfect, I call it a baseball farm team. That's really what it is because these are people that I may not need now, but maybe later. And if they never work for me or us, uh, perhaps they can recommend people that, that will. Uh, one guy today, as a matter of fact, wrote, he took a post I put up for a, a job that we have in uh, Omaha. And he said, he post, he shared it. And on top, it said, excellent company to work for. That's worth a lot to somebody like myself and to our company. Yeah. We're getting an endorsement from somebody who doesn't even work there that knows the company enough via all the social media stuff that we do, that he's willing to take his time and recommend us as a possible employer. So you get a lot out of meeting these people and staying in touch with them. Uh, the one thing to always remember, though, is don't use people that you run into. Don't only contact them when you need something from them. Build a relationship and say, you know, I'm running into this problem at work. Uh, I was wondering if I get your opinion and, and, and be able to do the same for them. You know, in social media, you got to give more than you expect back in return. And that's how you build strong relationships. And those relationships will lead you to better places in your career. Yeah, 100%. And I'll be honest, I'm not as active on LinkedIn as you are. My community that I'm active on is Reddit. And I'll just pitch that to everybody as Good. well. Um, there's Ask Engineers. There's a, there, And then each discipline of engineering also has a subreddit as well for those that are on Reddit. And that's my place where I pour in a lot more than I get out. I get a lot of joy out of it. So similar experience, not as professionally oriented it's more brand oriented for the podcast but it's a uh, another good resource for anybody that's wanting to ask about engineering there's a bunch of really probably the the most engaged upon posts are from people that are in high school or a middle school age that are asking about engineering uh you find that a lot of engineers will just pile on they love to talk to aspiring engineers about what they're what they do and what they experience and uh, i think that if you're in middle school high school that would translate to linkedin as well just like mark has said um just chime in and, and ask those questions and people you'll, you'll, you might be surprised by how many people want to answer and honestly take advantage of being young because people are even more willing to answer those questions whenever you're younger for sure without question if anybody ever turns you away then they weren't worth knowing in the first place just move on and uh that's their problem not yours that's what people are afraid of they're afraid to pick up a phone and be rejected uh, there may be people say i don't have time for this and if that's the case you don't want to know them anyway. You certainly don't want to work with them. Uh, and by the way, another pitch for a place to go is, have you ever been on Quora? Quora is a great, great place where people answer a lot of questions, technical questions. You can learn a lot. You can present questions and have other people answer. It's another good place to meet people and to uh, kind of develop your expertise in different things. So there's a lot, we're fortunate that we have the web because there's a lot of good stuff out there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of junk too. So you got to find the right places to be and related to what it is that you're looking to get out of it. And, and it's all mostly about relationship building and uh, building uh, mentorships and, uh, and also getting as much information about not only your career field, but how the job itself gets done when you're in it. You know, if you run into other engineers that maybe work for a different systems integrator or whatever, and they're willing to share, you know, maybe you could be really smart the next Monday, come into the office and say, I think I solved this problem. Nobody's going to ask you exactly who you spoke to, but uh -huh. an expert help an expert helped you. It's fine because you solve a problem for the company. Uh, people get information from all over the place. Nobody's going to you know check that sort of thing. The question is, what did you learn and can you do it and how does it help us? So uh, these are things that people should be doing a little bit in their spare time. I'm not saying stop doing everything you like. I mean, if you want to play golf, that's great. Uh, you should play as much golf as you can if you like to you know, do other music or sports. Absolutely, it's work-family balance, but dedicate a little time to that career thing. It's going to pay off in the end. Always remember, money follows value. So the more you learn and the better you perform, the more sought after you are by employers. It's, it's, it's all marketing one-on-one. -on -one. Have more stuff to show, and people will be interested in buying it. Amen. Amen to that. And also amen to the advent of all the web things. I mean, honestly, without all the web things, you and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to connect. I think we first connected either on Twitter or LinkedIn. I think it was Twitter. Uh, so that's another website. But without that, you and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to connect, which kind of brings me to my my closing question. Um, okay. Well, 
and my, my follow-up question after this will be what did I miss? But my last question is um, we connected through your profile along the ABCs of control systems engineering. So what is that and then why does it exist? It exists because we want to promote the field of engineering. Uh, there are a lot of holes out there. We discussed some of them. Uh, particularly for me, it's the soft skills. I want to get that out there. I want to kind of embed it in the other stuff that's out there. Uh, no question, it helps build relationships and it helps get the end result, which hopefully are some people that want to come to work for Thermo Systems. You know, if you're going to put time into it on a paid job, then it certainly has to be an ROI. Uh, but really, it's about employer branding as well. People know who we are. They're familiar with us. Hopefully, they go and check us on Glassdoor. They realize that all the wonderful things that we say are true. Uh, we don't have very many, if any, bad reviews there. Uh, so it, it's a lot about making sure that people know the Thermo brand as a, as a good place to work and also to help develop people that don't really have too many other places to go for the kind of assistance that we give them. I mean, if you look at the other group that I run on Facebook, and that's kind of non-denominational. You got all sorts of careers there. We don't focus on engineers. So you have retail people, you have real estate people. It almost runs itself. People post, I'm having this problem at work. What would you do? And all of a sudden there are 50 answers under that. People are giving of themselves. People are very helpful. I really want more engagement in the ABCs. I'm trying to figure out how to do that uh, because it's, it's not a site where anybody should be uh, ashamed to ask for help or, or to maybe post something that may be a bad answer to a technical question. Yeah, this is how we learn. And you learn from other people and people are very sympathetic about that. So people need to engage in these things. I hate lurkers, I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, uh, if you're not gonna participate in something, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, even lurking takes time and uh, you wanna be able to interact and be part of the human race and realize, reach out and touch someone as an old telephone commercial used to say. Uh, and I think it's important that people interact with one another and get to learn about how other people do their jobs in the same field. So the ABCs fulfills a lot of needs, I think, and I've seen it. We've gotten some high school students involved in engineering. They saw other engineers and the kinds of things that they're doing or the kinds of things that were posted and found an interest in it. Uh, a lot of compliments from that uh, group, uh, from people who really see a need. Uh, a lot of people complain about LinkedIn. They say these groups, you know, people just join and uh, there's no interaction at all. But I, I call people out on their birthday or on a job change, or I want them to remember that they signed up for this group a while back and were active. Uh, so that's always my goal, trying to get more people interacting with it so that it becomes more like the Facebook group and people just feel comfortable talking to one another. That, that's really my big goal. And, and it's a good goal because it's only going to produce good results, N not for Thermo, but for people just in general, looking looking for information, looking for, for relationships, uh, professional relationships. Yeah. And so people can find you at the ABCs of Control Systems Engineering on LinkedIn and Twitter. And I think your handle on Twitter is Mark Levine underscore jobs or sorry i keep on pronouncing your name incorrectly sorry mark levine underscore jobs i apologize that that is one of the things i usually get at the Happy beginning of well because i think when people go to spell it they realize levine is l-e-v-i-n-e -E. levine they're probably wondering is it l-a-v-i-g-n-e -E, like avril levine or something like that oh, so it's okay. i appreciate your grace i, I appreciate people, your grace i don't care what people call me as long as they call me but uh yeah i think that uh you know both groups i'd recommend to to the folks out there because they serve two different purposes. You know, one is is more about engineering knowledge. The other one is more about job seeking and career search. Yes, perfect. And, and again, that is M-A-R-C-L-E-V-I-N-E -E underscore jobs on Twitter, Mark Levine underscore jobs. So it. Mark, we have reached that point. I think we've either touched on all of the questions I had on the script or I've asked them explicitly. So I think generally, I think we've hit everything. So this is kind of your, 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 your last question is, is, do we miss anything else? If we did, I can't think of it. But what mm -hmm. I will say is that if we did, if anybody at all would like to reach out to me, uh, information interview, I taught you what that is. Feel yeah. free. 
Uh, my email address is M-A-R-C dot L-E-V-I-N-E, like Levine, we pronounce it Levine, M-A-R-C dot L-E-V-I-N-E at thermosystems.com, or message me on any of the boards that I'm participating on, and I'll always respond. And any help that I can give anybody to help make their lives better, to help them in their careers, I I'm more than happy to. If I don't have the answer, I will refer them to somebody who does. Thank you, Mark. And you you have been absolutely exceptional uh, as a guest for the podcast and, and the advice that you've shared. So I just want to thank you. This has been a very pleasant evening. I, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to spend it with you. And I, I appreciate you giving up some time late in your night. I know it's it's late where you are on the East Coast. So so thank you so much for, for your time tonight. Well, what I do watching television. So this is more important. Uh, yeah, I, a pitch for you. By the way, I've, I've seen many of your casts and they're excellent. So those of you tuning in for the first time, follow this podcast. There aren't a lot of real creditable ones out there. This is one of the credible ones. Uh, Dan is just a pleasure to talk with. He's a great interviewer. Uh, he does a great job and stick with it. And, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Mark. All right, I'll close out. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Engineering Success Podcast. And thank you again to Mark Levine for joining the podcast. It was an absolute pleasure having him, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you follow him, support him on his socials, and support his mission. He is a wonderful friend of the podcast, and I really appreciated having him on. But anyways, that's been the Engineering Success Podcast. Make sure to write in your questions to daniel at engringsuccess.com. I will answer them out of the pod. Make sure to leave your five-star reviews and make sure you support the pod. Thank you. Bye. Chasing payments, still playing in the basin while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries. Thank God that's amazing. But I'd rather thank Spotify. They put me on the station.